Yes. Oh, it's good, thank you. Um, I have no disclosures, however, I do have some acknowledgements in that a lot of what I know about this I have um, acquired through attending workshops like this, through a lot of the leadership of SAGES, and in particular, a lot of the things about this particular talk um, I, I got from a document that David Urbach prepared, and he'll, present, he'll be presenting a little bit later on. He, he knows that I, that I took a lot of this stuff from his, uh, his material, uh, which I found was very helpful. So why do people get grants? So essentially, I think the, the sum of it really is, is that the reviewers who reviewed your grant understood the ideas that you were trying to put forth. They somehow remembered what you were trying to say and it changed them or had an impact on them that was lasting. That your grant somehow was in alignment with the requests or the needs or the missions of the agency that you were applying to and that it scored highly in the process uh, and of course that there was enough money to award it. Um, writing a grant is hard work. And it's a lot more work than, well, it's just because it's, so, it's such hard work and so little people, so few people end up finally reading um, your grant, you know, based on all the hard work that you put into it. Um, you won't be awarded all the grants that you write, um, but I think you probably will learn something from every single one of them, and, and that's certainly how we improve. Um, all the most grant reviewers, no matter where you apply to, are very, very busy people. And so part of the grant writing process really um, is, is part of getting a grant is understanding the grant reviewing process and who are the people that are reviewing your grant and trying to make their lives as easy as possible. And I think that's really half the battle. And then I'll briefly mention this thing which I kind of, it's a little bit out of nowhere, but I think it's helpful in terms of trying to understand things. There's a, a book out there, it's really a marketing book that's called uh, how to make things stick, or I'll show you later on. And they have this analogy, which I think really has nothing to do with writing a grant, but I think a lot of the concepts apply, because it's the same thing. It's like you're trying to get people interested in your ideas, and a lot of the concepts are actually quite similar, and I think they lend very well to the whole grant writing thing. So as I mentioned, the reviewers, they're busy. They don't want to have to go searching around for things. They want to have their cake, and they want to eat it too, meaning the grant has to be perfect. It has to be well-written, grammatically correct, aesthetic, you know, all the, you know, the typefacing and all that stuff, that's a given. Like, right away, off the board, you have to make sure that all that stuff is, is done. It should be interesting and fun to read. It should address an important and relevant question, which, you know, we discuss is, a, is really part of, of designing your research in the first place. Of course, should be scientifically sound and meet all of the criteria and rules that they put forth in terms of number of pages, in terms of budgetary items, um, et cetera. So give them what they need. Th basically, the grant review process, essentially, most of the time, will, will consist of a committee um, where there is a primary reviewer that's assigned to your grant and probably a secondary reviewer and maybe a reader. And their role is really to read your grant critically and prepare a report to present to the larger committee, um, which really highlights the strengths and weaknesses. And it's usually guided by some sort of set of criteria. And so if you don't have those criteria before writing your grant, it's a good idea to try and obtain them if you can. If they're not readily available on the website or whatever, you can always email people because that should be your blueprint, your template essentially for writing your grant. Because they're gonna have that beside them when they're reading your grant and they're gonna wanna look for all those items um, as they're going through it. So in fact, they should just be able to cut and paste those items into their review um, and, and, and have it easy, easy to find like the titles should be bolded and they should be easy to find so that they can just go through that as they're going through reviewing your grant, they find all the information that they're looking for because it's very easy for them. They're not wasting a whole lot of mental energy looking for it and they're focusing on your ideas, which I think is, is the idea. So, the language should be simple, clear and consistent. So if you use terminology, <coughs> use the same terminology throughout. If you use an acronym, define that acronym and then use the same thing throughout. And it should be an expert in the field, um, who, uh, someone who is a, a knowledgeable, educated person, but not necessarily an expert in your field, should be able to read your grant and understand the ideas. So it's a, an excellent idea to get some of your colleagues, both people who are experts in the field to help you with the science and the whole grant writing process, but also people who are, let's say, a little bit outside of your field to read your grant and give you some honest opinions about whether or not they understood the ideas that you're trying to put forth. And I think probably one of the most important things is working on making sure that your specific aims are clear, understandable, and 
that the methods that you propose relate directly to your aims of, of your research. Um, it seems straightforward, but I think once you do a lot more of this and you start reading some grants and you, you can tell kind of right away when the idea is kind of fuzzy or it hasn't been well thought out, and I think um, that's probably one of the most important parts of writing the grant is to make sure that your ideas and your aims are doable, well thought out, and relate to your methods. Of course, the question um, has a lot to do with, you know, the research design and impl impl implementation, but certainly they won't give you any money to do it if the question isn't relevant in some way. Um, so uh, it's a good idea depending on the organization that you're applying to. There's a lot of organizations who have, New Sages has done this, and there's a lot of other organizations who have published research priorities. That might be a good idea to look at some of those questions and see if your grant addresses those. Um, and to try and convince the reader that what you're doing is relevant and that the results of your research, they don't have to, you know, be Nobel Prize worthy, but they should have some ability to create some change, whether even if it's a small change of some kind. And I think it's important also to tell the story of why it's important, um, and we'll get to that a little bit later when we talk about this uh, success thing that I was referring to. So check all the boxes, as I mentioned as well, but if you don't follow all of the rules, so especially, you know, some granting agencies get more grants than they can fund, and they're looking for reasons to reject your grant. So if you don't follow the rules in terms of what they ask for, then it's easy for them to just, in the initial process, reject your grant up front. So don't go through all the trouble to write the grant if you're not going to at least make sure that you follow those criteria. And um, I think this was mentioned in the previous talk, but it's very important that you have some sort of thoughtful way of, d of deciding how many, what your sample size will be. Depending on the type of research you're doing, this isn't always the most relevant thing, but I think in general, most quantitative research will require some sort of sample size calculation uh, for obvious ethical reasons, and so you really need to include that in your grant. Or address it, if it's something that's not appropriate to your grant, deliberately address it, because it will be one of their line items. Preliminary data is always a great idea because it, it shows credibility and, and shows that the ideas that you're proposing are doable within the context of your institution, et cetera. And I think it's always a good idea to put something in there that sets it apart from the other grants, something memorable, something that will help the, the, the reviewers retain um, or remember your grant. Write the aims and methods first. That's the most important. And then you can always write the background uh, introductory stuff. You know, it's, it's it's tempting to start from the beginning, but I think you'll often end up trying to refine and refine your background and going back and rewriting it instead of starting from your aims and methods and then going back to your background to help defend the aims and methods that you've put forth. Um, I already mentioned this by organizing your grant using cri the criteria that they recommend and try to obtain some samples of grants that have been funded in the past. I think it's a great starting point. Don't be shy, sell yourself, but also you're a team. And so I think most really high quality research nowadays is done in the context of teams, and that should be clear to the reviewers as well. I mean, you may be the principal investigator, you may be the one writing the grant, but you have people who are helping you with expertise and you're all working together to get this work done, and that you have the resources and so on, and that basically they have no choice but to fund your grant because the question is so good, your team is so good, and like they just can't help themselves. That's essentially the story you're trying to tell. And so this is the book, I highly recommend it. It's not a medical book, it's pop psychology, it's marketing, but it has some very like, cool ideas in it and I'll, I'll just briefly outline them I think in way of summary. So when you're writing a grant, um, try to make it simple, put something in there that may be unexpected. Um, the idea is concrete, credible, emotional stories. I'll just go very quickly. So, And they have a website and you can look through some of these issues and they have some great analogies that they give to illustrate each of, each of these concepts. I think it also will lend well to even in preparation of a talk. So we, I mentioned this already, the language should be simple and profound, and that doesn't mean short and brief, it means simple like, you know, like a proverb is the example that they give. And, and keep, it, keep in mind that the working memory of everyone who's reading your grant or the people who are hearing your grant in presentation is limited and they cannot remember everything and they cannot understand the whole field of the science that you're trying to do. So it has to be simple and understandable and the concepts have to be limited. Set yourself ap uh, apart from the other people who are writing grants. So 
the, a quote from the book, which I think illustrates it well. So we engage people's curiosity over a long period of time by systematically opening gaps in knowledge and then closing the gaps. So maybe not necessarily asking questions, but this is essentially the design of the grant, right? You're setting yourself up. The background is setting them up to kind of understand why your question is so important, and then you tell them how you're going to go about answering that question. So you can make it very exciting. <laughs> The idea should be concrete and doable, and I mentioned this as being very important in terms of lending credibility and proof that you're able to do the work. Um, you know what you're talking about, you've done it before, and you have all the knowledge and skills, so you have no choice but to convince them. They, they'll be, you can't be convinced otherwise. And I think this is something which you know, we don't often think about, but the people who are reviewing your grants are also people, and there's an emotional component to this, and you want to make them care somehow about your grant and, and somehow um, if you can, can relay your enthusiasm about, about what you're doing, then and that, I think, can show through. And it's all about also telling a story. We are hardwired in our brains to remember stories. A narrative is something that human beings are used to remembering that we already have in our minds a schema for retaining. And, um, and so if you tell the story in your grant, um, it'll be easier for the reviewers to remember it. That's all I got. Uh, well, I can mention this briefly if you allow me. <laughs> so they also mentioned this in their book, and I think it's an important topic. When you're writing a grant and when you're knee-deep in research and you know the topic so well, it's really easy for you to assume that, um, that there's a lot of knowledge that, isn't, that, the, that other people also know what you're talking about, but in fact they often do not. And so a good way of, of getting around that is asking your colleagues and other people to look at the grant and make sure that it doesn't make too many assumptions about the knowledge that people would need to have to understand your ideas. Here's some useful links. And I'll be happy to answer any questions or share the slides with anyone who would like to have them.